days, the number of Saturday in September. So if you're getting those calls, we can get masks with the purple vestments, only on the white vestments with me that covers everything except for the Rigby masks. Okay, so here today a few considerations on this intro Saturday on the fifth word of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. We are now in a great battle. We are in the crucifixion of our Holy Mother, the Church. And just like 2,000 years ago, our Lord Jesus Christ underwent a physical crucifixion, and this crucifixion was prophesied. It was prophesied by Isaiah that will look upon him who may have pierced. Prophesied by David. If you read the Psalm 21 today. And it was prophesied that it will be, he will have no comeliness in him at the top of his head, the bottom of his feet. And of the same Messiah, of the same Jesus Christ, is prophesied that he who will have no comeliness in him, he who is going to be scourged. And they will look upon him who have pierced, who is going to be sold for thirty pieces of silver, and all these other prophecies of the Old Testament concerning Jesus Christ. That this same Jesus Christ is going to rule all the world for all eternity. And that all the nations, all the Gentiles, shall bow down and adore him. Both prophecies are contained about Jesus Christ. And both prophecies are contained about his holy church. The mystical body of Christ, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, founded by our Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, is his own mystical body, as St. Paul says it is. And it also must create experience of crucifixion. Just like Jesus Christ experienced his crucifixion in the flesh, physically, so the church must also be crucified. And the prophecies of the victory, as well as the prophecies of the suffering, must both be fulfilled. Now, what is the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ? Palm Sunday, the day in which he is praised, the day in which all the people say to him that Hosanna to the Son of David, this day, what did Jesus Christ do? In the beginning of the day, what does he do? He waits. At the end of the day, when he goes down to the temple, what does he do? He pulls out a whip. And he scourges not only the money changers like he did the first time, three years before, and not only those who were son of the temple, but he scourges also the beasts. And he attacks the people. St. Jerome says, Consider Jesus Christ. The first day he went to the temple, he said, This is not a house of negotiation. This is not a house of business. Go out in the streets and do your business. And he took his whip and he scourged the money changers and he cast the beasts out. He was angry. Three years later, Three and a half years later, a few days before the crucifixion, he is beyond angry. He is filled with an infinitely greater and seen wrath. And St. Augustine says, notice the difference this time. He does not say this is a house of negotiation. You've turned the house of God, the house of my father, the house of business. Do your business in the streets. He rather said, you have made this a den of thieves. When you go into a den of thieves, who is guilty? Whoever's there. There are the thieves themselves who pulled out a whip this time, and he scourged not only the money changers, and he scourged also the animals and drove them violently from the temple, and he attacked the people in the temple, and they all fled him. There is anger, and there is anger. On Sunday, the day when Jesus Christ was praised, that morning, when he looked down upon the temple the city of Jerusalem, he wept most violent tears. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times would I have gathered thee under my wings? But thou wouldest not. And then when he was in the city, 
He pulled out a whip and attacked all those in the temple. This is how Christ acted on the day that he was popular. Six days later, he is crucified. On the way to crucifixion, he begins by the weeping of his blood. He went more deeply because he saw the sins of man that he would carry upon his own flesh. Therefore, for three hours he wept in blood. Then he went before six different trials, found guilty by the Holy Church, found guilty by the states. And before then he showed his power several times. If I have done wrong, show me what wrong I have done. But if not, why dost thou strike me? And they have no answer before Annas. Before Caiaphas, what does he say? Thou shalt see the Son of Man come in power and majesty. And he waits as he's being beaten and scourged. He's a man of sorrows. Then he arrives at the cross, hangs three hours upon the cross. And note the Spirit of Christ when he hangs upon the cross. Now that he hangs upon the cross, he is in the height of his sorrow, and he is in the highest point of what appears to be his defeat. What does he do? From that throne of the Holy Cross, he looks down upon all wicked humanity, not only those few thousand people standing there, but all the billions of men from the beginning of time until the very end of time who crucify him and hang him upon a cross. And his divine heart sees what he has come for. Therefore he says to the Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They don't know what they're doing. They do not know the degree of evil that is in their hearts. And the wicked thing they are doing put them to death, put them to death, the good God made man, who only came here to save us. But they crucify him. And he says, Father, forgive them. And what does he do from the cross? He is teaching us what we must do when we as followers. He said, if you want to be my follower, Take up your cross and follow me. When you are in the time of the cross, for we are not always through the pain of the cross, sometimes we receive great consolations. But there are times when we must feel the cross. There are times when we must feel tears. There are times when we must feel sorrow and pain. This is the time when we are taking up our cross. And then what does he say? When you take up your cross, Follow me. What does a doctor tell you when you have a cross? You have a headache. You have cancer. You have broken legs. You have all that kind of sickness. And the doctor says, take your rest. That's what the doctor says. When you are at a cross, when you are in pain, when your heart is wounded, when you are assaulted, the wise doctor says, take your rest. Very well. Then you can recover. But what does the foolish God who created us say? He who said, that which is wisdom for men is foolishness for God. And that which is foolishness for men is wisdom for God. What does he say? Are you wounded? Are you lying on your deathbed? Are you sick? Is your heart broken? Do you have wounds? Get busy. Start moving. Follow me. This is the time to show that you are my disciple. 
This is what St. Thomas, the Apostle, did on the day of his death. They pierced him with a spear in the side in the year 63, 61, 62 AD. They pierced him with a spear on the side, 72. And they ran away. And he walked the way of the cross. And the people followed him. He went up to the highest mountain to draw Cynthia, and he embraced the cross of stone that he himself had carved. And he bled to death. And as he was bleeding, he preached the word of God. He spoke of the divine love. And he converted countless souls. This is what we must do when we are bleeding. When St. Andrew was upon his cross, for three days he hung upon it. The cross in the form of an X. And what did he do while he was hanging upon his cross? He said, Become a follower of Jesus Christ, and if you are lucky, you also may be nailed to one of these. And the word spread throughout the whole area. This crazy man is hanging on the cross, and he likes it. Now, who was he imitating when he did this great miracle? Three days preaching from the cross. He was considering the words of Jesus Christ when he was on the cross. His first word, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then immediately he turned to the closest sitting next to him, which was a thief by the name of Dismas. And he made him to Saint Dismas that very day. That's what he made. This day I shall be in paradise. And then he gave his greatest gift that could ever be given to those whom he loves. And that is the gift of his mother. Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. He could give no greater gift to us. When did he give that gift? When we were spitting on him. When we were saying this man is defeated. When we spoke the words, he saved others, himself he cannot save. This is when he made that gift. It makes a gift so much more sacred that even in that moment, he gave his greatest gift to give to his mother to us. And then he speaks the mysterious word of the cross. The one word that doesn't seem to match. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This word, he speaks to his priests. They pray these words every week. They are supposed to have these words memorized. They are taken from Psalm 21, the Psalm of David. Some of the fathers tell us that when he said these words, he said those words and he said the entire Psalm of David. The whole of Psalm 21. Some say he spoke the soul song outside, say it like we do in the office. Deus meus, Deus meus, for me, dear Lord, to see. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's a long song. It is a song that should be known well by Caiaphas. It is his last appeal. Caiaphas repents. And all oh, you priests of God, whom Jesus Christ made priests, true priests of the Old Testament, you're about to be replaced by the priests of the New Testament. It is time for you to repent. Therefore he said those words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But what did he say? He spoke these sacred words. O oh God, my God, look upon me, why hast thou forsaken me? For from my salvation are the words of my, uh, my uh, far from my salvation are the words of my sins. 
O oh my God, I will cry by day, and thou shalt not hear, and by night, and it shall not be reputed to pass folly in me. He is speaking to his priests. You will cry by day. You stand at the altar of God. You celebrate the Holy Sacrifice of Mass. You stand in front of the people, and you pray beautiful words. I shall not hear. But it is not folly to cry at night. He told his priests, you must pray in the day. This is our duty, given to us by God, to pray in the day. These are the prayers that are said in the of the church. And these prayers are most powerful because they come from God. But Lord Jesus Christ says, I don't want to hear just the prayers you say according to your duty. I don't want to hear the prayers only you say because it is your job. What can you do at night? The night is a time when the people of the world sin. It is a time of impurity. It is a time of theft. It is a time of lies. It is a time of all wickedness. And this whole world is a night. And when the people are in sin, and when the priest is in sin, he does not pray in the night. Pray in the night. The night of this world and the night night. Pray in the night. Therefore, I shall cry by day, and thou shalt not hear. He shall hear the prayer. Like remember what St. Paul said. I pray for others. And I say to others, this does not mean I myself am saved. Therefore God sent me a thing of the flesh. For he said that strength is made perfect in infirmity. And so Christ spoke to St. Paul, the greatest of all apostles. Let us pray for the priests. That the priests of God, the Holy Church, Yes, they must do their public prayer of worship, the true Mass, and not the false modern Babylonian Vatican II. But they must do the true work of God in the day. But their work is only half done. They must also pray in the night. And he is reminding his priests. It, but thou was in the holy place in the praise of Israel, and thee of our fathers spoke. They cried to thee and they were saved. They trusted in thee and they were not confounded. But I am a worm, not a man, the scar of men, the outcast of the people. And I, they all they that saw me have laughed me to scar. They have spoken with their lips and wagged the head. These words should be known very well by Caiaphas. In Psalm 21, it says, won't be the whole song. It says, they will wag their head. They will curse. At the Messiah when he comes. For David said this psalm is a messianic psalm. There are seven messianic psalms. Psalm 21 is one of them. But the Jews said this psalm applies to the Holy Messiah when he comes. This is a psalm of the Messiah. And when the Messiah comes, this shall be fulfilled. And then he, Jesus Christ says these words on the cross. While the Apostle Caiaphas is standing right there. And what does he say in the same fifth word? And we're not in our eyes up to sink in me. My strength is permitted that they have dug my hands and my feet. They have pierced my hands and my feet. They have numbered all of my bones. And they have looked up and stared upon me. They have divided my vestments and garments among them, and upon my vesture they cast lots. These are the words of the psalm. And when did he say these words? When the soldiers took the vestments of Christ and they began to cast lots. And then Jesus Christ, in the final appeal of love, just like on the night before, he appealed to God to, to Judas, the priest of the New Testament. Judas, friend, does thou betray the son of man with a kiss? And Judas did not hear the word friend. And he betrayed the Son of Man in despair. Now Jesus Christ speaks to his priest. Don't you know the prophecy? You're standing right here, Caiaphas. You're standing right here, Annas. All you priests who put me to death. You're standing right here. Look over there. What do you see? They're casting vestures upon, they're casting moths upon my garments. 
They have divided their garments among them. Does that sound familiar to you? It's in the Psalm of David, and I recite it to you right now before your face. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Do you not see my hands and feet pierced right now in front of you? Behold, the prophecy is being fulfilled right now. And this is only halfway through the psalm. Do you think the other half will not happen? And so it is the Satanists. They know Jesus Christ's hand shall be pierced, but his priests have forgotten. They are afraid of the cross. There are many priests right now who are celebrating the Latin Tradition Mass. They go back to the true Mass, but they don't want it with names. They don't want it with pain. They don't want it with a cross. They want to have their Mass without a cross. What is the Mass? Is Jesus Christ dying on the cross in an unbloody manner? It is the same crucifixion of Calvary that is, they shall be carried until the end of the world. Like our Lord Jesus Christ said to his apostles in the Last Supper when he celebrated the Mass the first time, as often as you shall do these things, you shall do them in commemoration of me upon my cross. And you shall bear this, this crucifixion until the Lord come. That's what he said, and that's what the crucifixion is. That's what the mass is. And the priests have forgotten. The Satanists remember. The enemies of God remember. But his friends have forgotten. We continue the song. What's going to happen? All the earth returns against God. But what will happen? All the ends of the earth shall remember and shall be converted to the Lord's. And all the kings of the Gentiles shall adore in his sight. For the kingdom is the Lord's. And he shall have dominion over the Gentiles and over the nations. All the fat ones of the earth have, have eaten and have adored. All they that go down to the earth shall fall before him. And to him my soul shall live, and my seed shall serve him. They shall be declared to the Lord a generation to come. And the heaven shall show forth his justice to a people that shall be born, which the Lord hath made. Our Lord Jesus Christ says these words on the cross. There is a generation that's going to come that the Lord hath made, and the whole world shall bow down and adore, and the whole world shall follow Christ. The whole world shall accept the Father. Every kingdom shall be converted. And this is about to happen when the Blessed Virgin Mary's request is finally fulfilled. And Russia is consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. It is about to happen. It shall happen. And the generation shall be born. Every generation shall have to suffer something from Christ. In every generation, there shall be the spreading of the kingdom of Christ until the final generation, when St. Peter II, the final pope, fights against the Antichrist and the Jews convert. Until the final generation, there shall be a generation that shall be born. When you consider the king as he hangs upon the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Thou shalt not hear the prayers of the day. The sun is not yet set, it shall set at 3 p.m. But in the night, there shall be no folly in my prayers. And there shall be a victory. And here he speaks to his priests and he speaks to his church down the next 2,000 years. And especially in our times when the church is despised and the church is so much scandal in it. And those that are standing for the truth all specialize in being wimps. This is our age. But there shall come a victory. The generation shall be born, as it says in Psalm 21, and there shall be a complete victory. And then our Lord speaks in six words, I thirst. 
This fifth word was heard by the, those wicked priests, and they did not repent. Maybe one of them hopefully did, but Caiaphas and certainly did not. And then he says, I thirst. He thirsts for the victory. He thirsts for the salvation of souls. He is a great athlete, says St. Thomas, the great athlete thirsts. And then it is consummated. He has done the work of redemption. And now, the final word to be spoken from the whole world. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so speaks the seventh word. He cries out in a loud voice that is eighth and final word. And that will be the day of judgment. And give up the ghost. Then all shall be consummated. And the church militant shall be replaced by the church triumphant. And we must remember the church militant that we have the church fighting. And the church fights with the greatest confidence when it is in sorrow. And when we're in the time of tears, look to the victory. When we're in the time of tears, have confidence in God. And when you're tired, and when you're sick, and when you're exhausted, and when you're despised, take this. And take up the cross and follow Christ through the victory. Because of all, and the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. Amen.